Today, I'm going to talk about a case of congenital hearing loss. When I looked into this, I want, came in with a research question of why are children with Pendron syndrome missed on the newborn hearing screening? The first case study we're going to look at today is a 20-year-old male bimodal user who is diagnosed with congenital sensory neural hearing loss at two years of age. Two years later, a CT scan found a cochlear malformation and EVA for this patient. Within that same year, genetic testing confirmed the diagnosis of Pendron syndrome. It's important to note that this child was not implanted until the age of seven. They also, on their first try, did not pass the newborn hearing screening. When they came back for the rescreen, that child did pass the newborn hearing screening at that point. These are some examples of this first case study's audiograms. The first one was their very first audiogram they ever had. That was done in 2004, and this was done in the sound field using VRA. So as you can see, they have a nice sloping loss. That same year, later on, they were able to do play and use super oral headphones to obtain ear-specific information. As you can see, the ears still both follow the same shape as the shape that was obtained in sound field earlier that year. In 2005, you can see that there was a dramatic drop within that right ear, which brought this patient into the ability to obtain a CI. Their left ear also started a new shape. And then their very last audiogram that they have gotten in 2019, you can see that they are implanted in that right ear. So they are back within that normal range of the right ear. And then inserts were used to test this patient's left ear that has a very interesting shape to it. But as you can see, the fluctuations of the hearing and that left ear have continued on throughout this patient's life. Our second case study is a 12-year-old female who is diagnosed with EVA and also has Kippel and Pendred syndrome. This patient was diagnosed in utero with Pendred, so very different than our first case study that was diagnosed later on in life. This patient had a two-week NICU stay, and they passed their newborn hearing screening in the right ear and referred in the left ear. For this patient, their thyroid function is the main concern. Whereas in our other case study, the main concern was the hearing for that patient. The audio history for this patient is at five weeks old. They had an ABR that showed normal hearing at 500 hertz that sloped to a moderately severe hearing loss. They were fit with hearing aids at three months of age. Their hearing has remained stable, but in this patient's case, they are not progressing with their speech. She is a CI candidate, but her parents are not ready to move forward with a CI, even though she does have sibling, a sibling who has a CI already, but she, the sibling does not like the cochlear implant. These are an example of this patient's very last audiogram. So as we can see, she is a good candidate for a cochlear implant and her speech has not progressed. So she is getting 64% of words correct when we test that word recognition. And we would like her to be doing better than 64%, especially at her age, going through school and things like that. We really wanna see that word recognition increase. So what is Pendron syndrome? So it's a mutation of the SCL26A4 gene. It causes early childhood progressive sensory neural hearing loss, which is typically severe to profound. Something else that can be seen in children that have Pendred syndrome is goiter, which is an enlargement of the thyroid gland. This is more common for people in Pendred syndrome to have goiter and have thyroid issues, but it's not every single case will have it. So as you can see, our first case, they did not have any issues with their thyroid. In our second case, this is the main concern. Pendred syndrome can also cause potential balance problems. Specifically, children might start walking at a later age, but as we know, our vestibular system is very good at overcoming weaknesses, so this might not be something that stands out a lot in these children. Another thing that is seen with Pendred syndrome is the Maldini malformation, which will be EVA and cochlear hypoplasia, 
Most individuals with Pendred syndrome will show this Mondini malformation, which involves bilateral EVA. And then we have one and a half turns in the cochlea instead of the normal two and a half. And just an interesting fact to keep in mind when we go throughout this presentation is that EVA does cause fluctuating hearing loss in one third of the patients who are diagnosed with it. So how is Pendred syndrome diagnosed? So a quick reminder, a CT scan is needed to identify that Mondini malformation. Without that CT scan, we cannot confirm. They also need a thyroid exam to have regular checkups to make sure that the thyroid is looking good and there's nothing that needs to be monitored there. And then genetic testing using a multi-gene panel, which helps maximize the diagnostic rate, is needed to confirm the mutation of the gene and that it really is Pendred syndrome. This first study done looked at 26 patients with hearing tests more than twice using the same method. So they looked at these children before the age of three and then after the age of three. Before the age of three, they used ABR or ASSR for the hearing test. And then after the age of three, they used play audiometry. Everyone within this study had confirmed mutations and the hearing loss in EVA was the EVA was confirmed by CT scan, and then they had to have bilateral hearing loss. So out of these 26 patients, 22 of them had newborn hearing screening results. Seven of them passed in both ears and six only passed in one ear. So that's just a good reminder as that, again, these children who do have confirmed Pendron syndrome can be missed and pass that newborn hearing screening. So what this study found is that before the age of three, 14 of the 26 patients hearing decreased by more than 10 dB, and four of these children had fluctuating hearing loss. And then when they tested them after the age of three, three patients hearing decreased by more than 10 dB, and two children had fluctuating hearing loss. So what this is finding and what this shows is that children with Pendred syndrome can be born with significant residual hearing that deteriorates rapidly before the age of three and stabilizes after the age of three. So within those first three years, that's a critical period to test these children's hearing and make sure we know what's really going on. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit about what our newborn hearing screening is and what it looks like. It was established in 2001 and it states that you must use objective measures for doing the hearing screening. The goal of the hearing screening is to identify children with hearing loss at one month, diagnose them by three, and obtain some form of intervention or treatment by six months. The current measures that are used are OAEs and ABR. For babies in the well nursery, we see the AABR used. We want these children to be screened before hospital discharge. So it's important that if they need to be rescreened, we give enough time to get that done as we do not want a second screening to be performed right after their first screening. We wanna leave a few hours in between. Our newborn hearing screening also has a two-step protocol that can be used in the well baby nursery. What this states is if a baby is screened with an OAE and they refer, they can be rescreened with the AABR or OAEs, but if a baby originally is screened with an AABR, we do not want to use OAEs as a second form of screening. We should be rescreening with the AABR. The other thing is the newborn hearing screening can fail to identify borderline or mild hearing loss. So this goes back to the study that we just looked at on Pendred syndrome, where a lot of these children their hearing deteriorated kind of in that first three years, so they might pass in the hospital, but then those first three years, their hearing is going to decrease. This study specifically looks at sensory neural hearing loss after passing the newborn hearing screening. So I wanted to go a little bit more into that and see if there's more children out there who can pass and then get diagnosed with hearing loss later on. So this one specifically looked at children 78 patients who had a mean diagnosis of four years old and six months of age. They found that hearing loss was identified most by parents and failed school screenings with speech and language delay and primary care failed screenings accounting for the rest of those patients. 42 
of these patients had bilateral sensory neural hearing loss, and 13 of them, the cause was genetics. Out of these children who had newborn hearing screening results that could be obtained, 12 had OAEs done and seven had an ABR done. So as you can see, although our hearing screening does help, it can still be still miss some of these children who might have a mild hearing loss going into it. And also with the genetic part, if we're not doing any genetic screening, we might not know to closely watch some of these children, even if they've passed that newborn hearing screening. So to sum up with Pendred syndrome and why these children are missed, they can have good residual hearing at birth. We know that the hearing can deteriorate rapidly by age three. EVA can cause fluctuating hearing loss. So these children might not always have that same hearing when tested. Our newborn hearing screening can miss borderline or mild hearing loss. Not all cases of Pendred syndrome are going to present the same. They're kind of all over the place. Some children might, their thyroid might be the issue. Some children might only have the hearing loss. We never know how they're going to look. And parents may not also know the warning signs of hearing loss. So even though their child is passing the newborn hearing screening, they think it's all good to go. And they might not know that in the future, some things to look at and keep an eye on just in case. This last study looked at improvements for our newborn hearing screening. I was interested in this just to see if it could help make a difference with some of these children who might pass and be missed. And so what they looked at is modified genetic testing and a hearing screening combination to help identify these children. They found that the GJB2 and the SLC26A4 are the most common gene mutations among the population. And within this specific study, 32,000 infants participated. And these were the two most common gene mutations. And what they found from this is that 50 infants with hearing loss were identified with a genetic mutation. And then along this, they found that 142 were identified with hearing loss by three months. And out of these 50 that had genetic mutations and were identified with hearing loss, 31 of them passed the newborn hearing screening. So that's still a large amount of these children who have genetic mutations and hearing loss and are passing the newborn hearing screening. So what their suggestion is by adding in some type of genetic screening or that CMV screening, it can help identify newborns missed by just the hearing screening alone. It could provide etiologic information if parents are interested in wanting to know why their child has a hearing loss or just even for research purposes. And it can help decrease the number of children with late onset hearing loss, which brings me back to the point of we want to diagnose and identify these children within the first couple months so that we can provide them some form of intervention by six months of age. These are my references. Thank you for listening today on my case studies about Pendred syndrome and what we can do to help.